I think we all are using, as you mentioned, uh, TDM1 or trastuzumab amtansine in patients who fail to have a pathologic complete response. This patient had a pathologic complete response. I think it's really easy to decide when a patient has positive nodes or a big tumor left, but um, we are seeing that, as was seen in Catherine, much more frequently in patients with ER positive disease, you know, which represented 70% of the patients in Catherine, and is as we expected from prior trials. But one of the things that certainly I have faced in clinic that's an issue I'm interested in your opinions is patients who have 0.3 centimeters of disease left, um, you know, a T1A. What do you do with those patients? Adam? Yeah, that is the question of the moment right now. And I think that it's a really, it's a toughie. I mean, I think that my own personal kind of thought process is right around T1A. I think that even I'm even starting to think about extending it to T1B, but as we all know, it's a completely data-free zone. There are data that's not a complete data-free zone, but I think as, you know, from Catherine, we do know that the patients even with T1A, T1B residual disease appear to benefit um, from uh, TDM1 versus trastuzumab. You know, it's a great question, and it, you know, it really depends on what you really think of the biology. I mean, are you really thinking it's resistant disease, or do you think maybe if I gave one more cycle of TCHP, maybe seven instead of six, whether well, they had a PCR? And that's the debate. It's a real toughie, um, and I, I have to tell you, there's no right answer to this. Right now, uh, I think that I really, T1As, I'm probably not. If you have to put, if you tell me exactly what, I'd probably say that. But after that, I think I probably would give it. How about you, INT? Are you giving it for the little tiny? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I agree that it philosophically, it feels like there probably should be some lower limit. But, you know, if you look at the Catherine subgroup data, you know, even patients who have T1A, they didn't break it down as quite as uh, precisely as I think we would like. But if you look at the group that's no negative in T1A or T1B, you know, the difference in absolute IDFS was something like four or five percent. So they weren't able to identify a group that didn't seem to benefit from TDM1. Um, I, you know, I think one would just assume intuitively that the benefit's going to be smaller in the patients with less disease, but you know, they're still... That's the mystery. That's the I mean, mystery. That's exactly the mystery. I mean, T1A, you know, is it really four or five or is it like one or two? And is yeah, one yeah, or two yeah. worth it for a year of this? Yeah, that's the whole problem. Right. I guess my feeling is that... Um, uh, that given the data we have, that we weren't able to identify a group that didn't seem to benefit. And in truth, the added toxicity of, of 14 cycles of TDM1 compared to 14 cycles of HP, um, and we can get into whether we should be using HP in that setting, but, you know, isn't really not that different. And if you get, you know, six or eight cycles of TDM1 in and the patient stops uh, because of, you know, it's one of the 18 or 20 percent of patients who can't do the whole 14 cycles and you have to switch to trastuzumab or HP at that point. It's not the end of the world in my, in my sense. So I, I typically am still using TDM1 for virtually all the patients who have, you know, more than isolated tumor cells left over. So let's, and, I, and we have been too, I think the patients just, you know, it seems like a small trade-off for us now and the cost is not as big of an issue for us as it might be in other countries, but it's still an ongoing issue. I'm going to close up this particular case with uh, a question to each uh, one of you, and I just want a very short answer. So one sentence. So uh, the first question is, Adam, is there a patient in which you would give neratinib after 12 months of adjuvant therapy? Which yes. patient? Substantial residual disease, ER positive substantial residual disease. So we know 50% of the patients who are ER positive will not have a PCR. Now, the real question becomes how much residual disease do they have? And if it's substantial, I will offer them uh, adjuvant and retinib. And that probably, when it comes down to it, is maybe 15, 20% of the patients who I take care of uh, with this kind of uh, HER2 positive neoadjuvant therapy. So that's kind of the decision. I think the big problem doing it, I think the diarrhea, we're kind of getting there. I think with the dose escalation and with the other antidiarrheals like cholestopol and podesonide, I think they're really getting to be able to manage it. But I think what's happened is that a lot of women after a year of doing their therapy are kind of tired and they really want to break. And so it has been a tougher sell, to be honest with you, than anything. That's the biggest issue. But I think, I think from a medical standpoint, I think the data is pretty clear. Uh, it's not clear with pertuzumab, I have to agree, so it's really not that clear, uh, having said that. But uh, I'll tell you, I mean, it's offering in the right patient a substantial disease-free survival benefit, you know, probably 4 or 5% in a limited subset of patients that had neoadjuvant therapy and extant. 
So okay. there's something so there. Think that's, and I, think I think that's really interesting. And I think, you know, there is a group of patients for whom we still feel like we're not really meeting our goals in, in providing the best, you know, like a curative set, setting where they have this residual disease. Um, but what about the other end of things, Ian? In a very quick uh, response, if somebody has a path CR, do you always continue a year of H and P? Yeah, so I think that to me, that's actually the bigger controversy uh, because it affects more and more of our patients. Um, and you know, my thinking is if they were high enough risk at the beginning to give them neoadjuvant to add pertuzumab to your regimen meaning that they were either node positive um, uh, or uh, you know, large, uh, clinically no negative, um, that I think it makes sense to continue the pertuzumab even after a pathological day response. And that's based on two reasons. One uh, is that really the only good long-term data we have on the benefits of pertuzumab are from affinity, and that's used a year, whether you're giving it neoadjuvant or adjuvant shouldn't really matter. Um, and that you know, this is a patient population who clearly has shown sensitivity to their dual HER2 therapy. Um, so you know, for those two reasons, I think it makes sense to continue the pertuzumab. But if you start out with a low risk patient, I think either you don't, um, you don't give pertuzumab in the adjuvant setting, or if you do, then that would be a patient who um, you, it would be, make sense to stop it and just give trastuzumab for the rest of the period. Thanks very much. This is a fascinating discussion and I think really interesting. It's going to be uh, also very interesting to see the new studies, the trying to de-escalate in responders from the uh, cooperative groups, as uh, Ian mentioned, and then uh, new trials that are looking at oral TKIs to try and reduce CNS recurrence, which although occurring in a small number of patients appears to still be occurring at about the same percent. So it's going to be uh, interesting to continue to see uh, the progression of treatment options for early stage HER2 positive breast cancer. 